at the Infometrics, Infometrics Institute, and Amos and I are working on some things together. And uh, I'm uh, very p pleased to uh, be able to talk to uh, the seminar and the other people in the audience. And uh, I have to explain quickly that it will have almost nothing to do with economics, at least directly, right? Uh, I like to think logic has something to do with most everything indirectly, right? I'm no longer quite sure, having seen what's been going on in the Washington recently. But uh, anyway, uh, that's all the politics. I uh, have often been asked, I'm sitting on an airplane, right? And somebody asked me, uh, you know, what do you do? And uh, I y used to say, uh, I'm a philosopher. And then we would get into some deep discussion about the meaning of life or the, some problems they've been having or whatever, right? And uh, then uh, I was lucky, my PhD advisor, this the University of Pittsburgh, was working with computers early on, a logician, Newell Belknap. And uh, so uh, I began to work more and more with computers and finally uh, even became a prof professor of computer science. And uh, then I could sit on the plane and they would ask me, what is it you do? And I would say, uh, computer science. And then they would tell me about some problems they were having with their computer at home or something. <laughs> right. And uh, once I sat next to somebody who asked what he did, and he was a computer scientist with Siemens. Yes, what I did. I'm a computer scientist at Indiana University. We were half through the plane ride before we realized we'd both been philosophers uh, <laughs> early on. And then we started to talk about that. Kant and so on. And uh, the common thread, there must be many of them actually, but the, the big one between uh, computing uh, and informatics with philosophy is logic. Uh, and I'm going to start with a little bit about the history of logic and the concept of information. And then I'll sort of morph, as it were, into more and more technical things. and then I'll actually be able to say some of the things, almost that you didn't take the time to say about my own <laughs> work. And uh, I just uh, hope you get something from this. And feel free, the way my understanding is, this is a two and a half semi hour seminar. I'm not going to take that much time, I hope. Uh, and uh, we'll have room for discussion afterwards. And uh, feel free, though, at any time to interrupt if I can help make something clear. So the purpose of the talk is to outline the role of the concept of information and development of modern logic, particularly so-called non-classical or non-standard logics. I want to motivate a duality wherein information and computation are just two sides of the same coin. We're so used now to talk about information technology, right? As it's a shorthand for things having to do with information and computation. I want to show you that information and computation actually have very close connections. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm going to use the occasion that I've already indicated to highlight my moi work, right? So let's begin. Uh, the lectures can be viewed as a loose combination of my paper, The Concept of Information, the Development of Modern Logic in Non-Classical Approaches in the Transition from Traditional to Modern Logic. And it's a book. And then in the my article, Information in Computer Science, in the Handbook on the Philosophy of Information, uh, edited by Johann van Bentham and Peter Adrians. Peter, incidentally, is also a member of the uh, Informatics Institute Advisory Board. And uh, I'm not going to give you many references. I'll give you some dates and so on. But if you want to find these references, uh, they could be found uh, in one of these two places. And of course, feel free to uh, email me. Uh, I didn't put my email address here. It's an easy one. B U N N at Indiana dot E D U. That's one of the advantages of being an early adopter. I was using email in computer science, I think, back in 1978. So I got the name done. Uh, let's see. What does information mean? It has many th thesaurus equivalents. 
If you look, you can find content, meaning, interpretation, significance, intentionality, semantics, knowledge, etc. I mean information in roughly the sense in which the word is used in information technology. That probably doesn't tell us too much because it's used a lot of different ways. But information is to be contrasted with knowledge. Plato took knowledge, at least as a starting point, to be justified true belief. That, then information is left of knowledge when one takes away belief, justification, and truth. <laughs> so it's sort of your, what you might think of as your thoughts, your, you know, your mental content, right? But there's no need for justification, no need for truth, and no, not even for belief. You can just be thinking about this information. Uh, if you think there's something more to knowledge, uh, I was talking to Bob today about something called the Gettier Paradox, which suggests there has to be something more. Uh, for example, reliability. A lot of philosophers have looked at this sort of thing, but I mentioned Alvin Goldman. You take away that, too. So it's just the bare, bare bones, right, of what's in your mind when you're thinking, as it were. Uh, Luciana Foridi, also on the advisory board, uh, thinks that information must be true. And he and I have had extended discussions both in print and in person about this. And uh, I take th th that as a pragmatic implication. If I tell you I have some information, you expect it to be true, right? Just as if I offer you some food, you expect it not to be poisoned. <laughs> but false information is information. And it's, I'd just be misleading you, right, by not pointing out that it's false, just as I would be totally badly misleading you if I didn't point out I had poisoned the food. But it's still food, <laughs> uh, poison food. So there's information that's false. Uh, OK. Let me, OK, it's working. Uh, here's a slide I call Plato's Revenge. Uh, this is from an article in the New York Times uh, almost a couple of decades ago now. It was entitled The Messy World. Uh, part of the current backlash against the Internet is the desire to speak up for messy, specific, embodied things as distinct from their information content. So we want to hold books, for example. Uh, actually, the idea of a split between the corrupt, confusing material world and the real world of abstraction dates back to Plato, who saw perceptible reality this table, say, as an imperfect embodiment of a realm of perfect forms. For example, a perfectly flat plane extending in infinitely in all directions. Uh, the current emphasis on information resembles a familiar turn in Western thought, denigrating the earthbound, elevating the abstract. Cyberspace, writes the philosopher Michael Heim, in a very nice book called The Metaphysics of Virtual Reality, is Platonism as a working product. So we have the abstract of Plato's world, abstract forms, right? The number four, the perfect square, uh, perfect uh, virtue, and so on, right? And now we're trying to embody these in ma the material world. This is a painting I like very much. You can't see it too well. It's from the uh, School of Raphael. So, uh, sorry, it's from Raphael, and the school of, it's called the School of Athens. And here are all kinds of people floating around. I won't try to identify them, but if you look closely, you can find Euclid, for example, with a protractor, of course. And uh, these are the two central figures here. And they are Plato and Aristotle. And I'll give you a close-up. Plato is the one pointing up. And Aristotle is the one pointing down. <laughs> So Plato's sort of pointing up to the heavens, as it were, and Aristotle's pointing to the natural world. I'll go back so you can see it in con Oops. Sorry. So you can see it in context. They're discussing there, as philosophers are prone to do. So Plato's pointing up, and Aristotle's saying, no, no, down. It's the earth that's important, material world. Now, the quick story about the Renaissance is that the rediscovery of Aristotle's works, remember that the library of uh, Alexandria was burned, and they, they passed through the Arab world, and finally up through Spain to Europe, and so on. The rediscovery of Aristotle's works led to an emphasis on the material world and the development of science and technology that allowed the manipulation of the physical. Uh, the quick story about our new Renaissance, which you might call our re-Renaissance, 
our, re -re our re rebirth, not nascence, it means birth, is the rediscovery of the importance of platonic abstractions, information, and development of science and technology that allows for the manipulation of the abstract, or at least our representations of the abstract. I don't think anybody's ever seen a number, right? But we've seen many different representations of numbers, uh, whether they're Roman numerals or the Arabic numbers done in the usual uh, 10 uh, digits, or whether they're binary two and two digits, zero, one, that we computer science like, and uh, so on. So the Port Royal logic began in the very, in the Renaissance. Yes? Right. Yeah. I, I'm not saying, Amos, that they're exactly the same, really, but uh, I think that, uh, you know, P Plato thought, you know, that our words are standing for something. What they're standing for is the forms. And we only roughly approximate. He had this lovely metaphor, which I'm sure many of you, if not all of you know, of the uh, living in the cave and you see only the shadows on the wall. And that's like the material world, right? And the real world outside, you know, is much, has much more content, much more to it, right? And they use that analogy with our own world, right, is sort of like the cave. And then the forms are being reflected in our own world. So I see this as a plane. It's not really a plane. It's got sides. It's got some scratches here, et cetera. Um, so, yes. So in this context, do you think, I mean, we can say the same thing as Newton, uh, law of mechanics. Sorry? Do you, do you think of Newton's law of mechanics as information? Yes, or yes. Information, Infor information, yes. Again, reflecting an imperfect reality, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you tr actually try to do the measurements and so on. It's not quite that way, but... Uh, it's, it's an abstraction. So the Port Royal logic, you grew out of, there's a lot of logic done in the Middle Ages. Sorry. Sorry. How does the poisonous food then compare to the photonic food form? So if that's still information, but it's got to be photonic food, food how, how do you assess that both? Uh, I wasn't getting into issues of truth and falsity there. Uh, I mean, uh, in terms of the forms, right? I mean, we can make a lot of mistakes about the forms. Uh, look at any uh, elementary school <laughs> in terms of the students learning to add and multiply and divide and so on. So we can be mistaken about the forms, right? And, uh, it, uh, but it's still, it's about the forms, as it were, I guess I would say. And uh, I can be, have false information and, you know, as I said, it's like poisonous Food. The point I was trying to make was that uh, it might seem odd to say false information. Uh, Luciano Floridi would insist that we should say instead something like misinformation or disinformation if it's intentionally false. But I'm trying to say I think information's information. <laughs> and whether it's true or false doesn't matter. It's still information. Uh, that's an that's other issue, whether it's true or false. Does that make sense? Okay. So, the Port Royal logic. It grew out of a lot of very good logic that was started with Aristotle, uh, developed uh, through the Romans uh, into the um, Middle Ages. I have a colleague at Indiana, Paul Spade, whose specialty is medieval logic. But the Port Royal logic was perhaps the beginnings of what we might think of as quote unquote modern logic. And it was written by a group of people. Nobody knows, there wasn't an author, right? It was a group of uh, people, uh, and they, they, they wrote chapter 6, I call the comprehension of an idea the attributes that it contains in itself and that cannot be removed without destroying the idea. For example, the comprehension of the idea of a triangle contains extension, must you know, spread out, has to have shape, uh, it has to have three sides, three angles, and the equality of these three angles, the two right angles, etc., I call the extension of an idea, the subjects to which the idea applies. They're, they're also called the inferiors of a general term, 
which, in, which is superior with respect to them. For example, the idea of a triangle in general extends to all the different species of triangles. So you have sort of two thoughts here. One is what the idea of a triangle comprehends, uh, and that involves you know, things like three angles and so on. And then there's also what it's applied to, and that is all the various species of triangles. Now that is not yet to apply the concept to triangles in the world, not a triangle on the board. That's a species of triangle might be something like the right triangles, right? And or the equilateral triangles or things like that. But at least it's a step to say that there are two things that a term does, a predicate does. One is to include certain other predicates in its meaning. And the other is to apply to certain things, or in this instance, certain kinds of things. Now, that's going to be very important as we move on. John Stuart Mill, in the middle 1800s, wrote, uh, he defines a connotative term as one which denotes an object and implies an attribute. The word white, as well as denoting the various things we call white, so we could have all the various plates over there, for example, and the snowballs, wherever they are, and so on. Uh, it also connotes the attribute of whiteness. This is like the, what Port Royal Logic was talking about when it talked about comprehending. It connotes, is the word he uses, the attribute of whiteness, which these things all share. The term Socrates, by contrast, denotes a particular person, and this was their view, without telling us anything about the properties. Proper names have no con connotation but only denotation on the view of J.S. Mill. Mill thus by connotation means something like the Port Royal comprehension, but by denotation means something quite different, at least quite clear. In fact, what is meant by the modern use of the term extension. So in modern logic, you'll get see this later, we distinguish between intention and extension. The intention is roughly put the meaning, and the extension is roughly the actual things that it stands for, things, let's say, in the material world. They don't need to be in the material world. They could be abstractions themselves, like the numbers. Uh, but uh, it could be, uh, basically, it's, it's the things having to do with the meaning of the term versus what the term is standing for, what it denotes. Hey, yes? The, the, the sentence that says, the term Socrates, by contrast, denotes a particular person yes. without telling us anything about its properties. That's right. It, it doesn't seem true. I mean, when the term Socrates comes out, it's going to combine many properties. It does. That's right. But no unique. It brings to mind. And uh, you might, we might identify Socrates in different ways. Like I might think of him as the uh, person who created the theory of the forms. Uh, somebody else, Aristotle, might have thought of him as the student of Aristotle. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Aristotle might have thought of him as his teacher. I've got it absolutely backwards. Uh, and uh, so on. So, but this is not part of the meaning of the word Socrates. But you've got a point that we all have our own mental handles, as it were. But there's no agreed upon meaning, right, of the term Socrates. I could name my puppy Socrates, and that's another Socrates, right? Uh, okay, but good point. Now, we get to one of my favorites, Boole. Boole had the notion of primary and secondary propositions. Uh, if you know anything about George Boole, you know that he created something that's now called Boolean algebra. And Boolean algebra is at one and the same time both an algebra of sets. You have two sets, A and B. You can form the intersection, A intersect B, and so on. And it's also the algebra of logic. You have two propositions, A and B. You can form their conjunction, A and B, right? Well, that's why he had two interpretations. The primary interpretation was that they were sets. The secondary interpretation was that they were propositions. He connected the two saying that a proposition could be regarded as a set, namely the set of times in which it is true. A former student of mine, Randy Dipert, made this very clear in his dissertation back in 78, which became a book in 78, actually. Uh, and so you can think of it, these times are sort of not meant literally, but something more like moments or something more metaphorical along the lines of occasions or cases. 
And then we get something like what I'll be calling the UCLA propositions in a bit, a bit later. But the idea is you can think of a proposition as, like, uh, let's say the proposition that it's raining in Washington, D.C., as the set of times at which it's raining. That's the way of kind of representing the meaning in a very concrete way. Frege. Many people regard Frege as the sort of founder of modern logic. Uh, he had a sense and reference. Sense roughly means what we think it means, meaning, and the German is Sinn. Reference is roughly denotation, uh, and it's bedeuten. And then he had this great saying, sense is the route to reference. And we'll make more of that in a moment. Remember that on Mill's account, not all terms have meanings in his sense of connotation. We were saying Socrates, that term does not have, so I didn't, uh, I've, I've got that backwards. Remember on Mill's account, not all terms have meaning in his sense of denotation. Uh, that is Socrates, I, 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 I had it right, I'm sorry have sense, meaning in the sense of connotation. Socrates does not have meaning in the sense of connotation. There aren't particular properties or attributes, right, that are part of the meaning of the term Socrates. There's an individual that the term denotes, but there aren't a set of meanings, as it were. To the contrary, Frege thought all terms have both a sense and a reference, both a connotation and a denotation. The sense of the term Socrates is an individual concept. It's a strange notion, uh, but he had it. Uh, this will be a particular individual concept that somehow denotes Socrates, connotes Socrates and nothing else. Uh, so maybe you know, we should have some world meeting or something and decide that the meaning is that uh, Socrates was the uh, st teacher of Aristotle or something like that. Uh, but uh, we don't have that meeting. But that, he thought, nonetheless, there was an individual concept. And its reference, he thought, was the individual Socrates. The sense of the predicate wise, he thought, was the general concept, we might say property, of wisdom. And its reference is the set of wise individuals. And the sense of this sentence, Socrates is wise, is the thought or proposition, the meaning of that sentence that Socrates is wise, and its reference is the truth value. In this case, true. I take it Socrates was wise. If you think otherwise, its uh, reference is false. So this leads us to Carnap. Uh, Carnap's method of intention and extension, uh, Carnap writing in the uh, 40s and 50s, basically, took the idea of trying to make this much more concrete. A state description is a conjunction containing each atomic sentence or its negate. So to give you a very rough, an artificial example, a uh, state description might be something like uh, Amos is, Dolan is in room, what is the room? What? Okay. And, uh, President Barack Obama is not in the room, <laughs> whatever it was, and, uh, and it's raining you know, at such and such a time, and it's not raining at such and such another time, and E equals MC squared, and you just go through the whole list of things, right? Uh, should, they should be atomic statements, though, so E equals MC squared is probably not one of those very fundamental atomic statements. And it's a syntactic surrogate for a possible world. It's supposed to be sort of a complete description of the world or maybe a world, maybe not this world, some other world that doesn't exist. Carnap interpreted sense as the route to reference to mean that the intention or meaning of a sentence can be represented as a map from state descriptions to its possible extension, so, i.e., the truth values T and F. So, you know, that uh, is to say it, that we're thinking of these state descriptions as something like possible worlds, and then we're thinking of them as being either true or false, and that's the 
idea of sense is the route to reference. It's a map from possible worlds, state descriptions, call them what you will, to truth values. As Carnap knew, state description can be generalized to allow for an infinite number of atomic sentences by two-valued interpretation functions sending each atomic sentence to either one, that's the way we computer scientists do it, but that's true for a philosopher, or zero, false. So each two-valued interpretation determines a two-valued valuation on compound sentences that respects the truth functional connectives. So conjunction, you know, phi and psi, it's true just in case both are true. Phi or psi is true just in case at least one is true. Not phi is true just in case phi is false and so on. And Carnap observed too that the valuation can also be extended to modal connectives. This box here means necessity. Uh, so necessarily phi is true just in case phi is true not just at that valuation but at all valuations. If something's necessarily true if it's not just true in this state description, in this possible world, but in all state descriptions, in all possible worlds. So, you know, it's raining or it's not raining would be one of those. Uh, this in effect shows contra frega that modal sentences too can be signed both a sense, an intention, and a reference, extension. Frege had this idea about uh, necessity that it was just a form of judgment. You could view something as necessary or not viewed as necessary, but you couldn't iterate it. You know, you can iterate con conjunction and disjunction and negation. I can say it's raining and either the will, sun will shine tomorrow or there will be clouds. Or so I can say things like that. Embed one, we call them connectives, and or not, in other connectives. Frege didn't think you could do that. But Carnap said, here's how you do it. Uh, Kripke's 1959, this is the famous Saul Kripke, provided absolute semantics for the modal logic S5 was preceded by Carnap's 1946 work. Carnap used state descriptions. Kripke, though, introduced this very powerful idea of a possible world. And he also introduced a relativistic semantics in 1963 using an accessibility relation. And we'll say more about that in a moment, I think. But the idea is that instead of just saying, something's necessary if it's true at all possible worlds. We say it's necessary at, in this world if it's true at all worlds that are possible relative to this world. There may be a lot of worlds that aren't possible relative to this one because we have in mind that the world uh, is, is a certain way that might prevent other possible worlds from existing. And uh, so this was Kripke's idea and Kripke's possible worlds were really just elements of a set, and R Richard Montague called them with appropriate abstraction, indices. But this shows you the difference, frankly, between uh, being uh, a, a scientist and being a good marketer, and you, it's good to be both. Uh, obviously, indices aren't going to sell. <laughs> possible worlds, yeah, that's a much more exciting idea. Uh, UCLA proposition. My teacher, Newell Belknap, first recalls hearing the term from his teacher, Alan Ross Anderson, in the 1960s. But Belknap doesn't necessarily think it was Anderson who originated the term. It comes from Carnap and Montague, he thinks, both being at UCLA. And of course, uh, UCLA proposition, as I've already indicated, is just a set of possible worlds, whatever those are. A uh, little aside, uh, it's beyond the scope of this talk, uh, the explore the development by Richard Montague, Barbara Partee, and others of so-called intentional logic and their application of the semantics of natural language. But I'd be remiss for not mentioning this very important application of the Frege Carnap ideas. Davidson and Harmon, in volume 1972, put together a collection of many early papers in this tradition, particularly the paper by Lewis there, David Lewis, called General Semantics is uh, clear about the, his debts to Carnap. And this has been very influential in linguistics. Uh, and I guess I'll brag a little bit about my multidisciplinarity. But uh, I taught at Yale for a year, and my position was funded by philosophy, of course, uh, linguistics, and electrical engineering. <laughs> so uh, it, uh, there are lots of interactions between philosophy and a lot of different subjects.
Oh, and I gave lectures in the math seminar. So. Carnap and Bar Hillel's theory of semantic information. This is extremely important. They did this in 1952. Uh, they gave a qualitative definition, the basic idea of which goes back to Boole, with the information of a sentence phi, I'm going to write int phi, being some subset of a set U. So think of U as a set of possible worlds or state descriptions. And so we assign to each sentence phi a set of those possible worlds. And so the information, right, in not phi is just the complement of the information in phi. Uh, a, a world is makes not phi true just in case it doesn't make phi true. Uh, the information in a conjunction is just the intersection of the information in both conjuncts. That's simply to say phi and psi is true in a world just in case phi is true in the world and psi is true in the world. Whoops, there's a typo. You see that phi there? That should be a psi. I have a good friend, uh, Boss Van Frosen, a very good philosopher. Uh, we were graduate students together. Uh, he uh, had a proof when he was a graduate student that every manuscript, I think it applies to slideshows too, contains an infinite number of typos. And do you all know what mathematical induction is? You know, you show something for the number one and then you show that if it holds for n, it must hold for n plus one. He said, there's the base case, that holds for one, proof by inspection. Well, we have the base case. <laughs> and then the rest of the proof, of course, goes for however many errors n you find, if you look just a little longer, you'll find another one. So anyway, that's n plus 1. Uh, phi or psi, of course, is the information that is the union of the information phi and the information in psi, which is just a fancy way of saying that phi or psi holds in a given world just in case phi holds in the given world or psi holds in the given world. And they also had a dual notion, which they preferred actually, of content. Information, uh, information inf, is what states the sentence includes. What information states, I should be making that clear. I like the term information state much better than uh, state description or possible world. Uh, so they, in, in information is what information states the sentence includes. The content is actually the negative of that, what information states it excludes. And of course it has the dual properties. The content of not phi is still the union of the content, uh, minus the content of phi. But the content of phi and psi, what makes phi and psi False, right, is either something that makes phi false or something that makes, again, there's the same mistake. I must have cut and pasted. Uh, I've actually wondered about uh, my friend Voss Van Frozen's uh, conjecture or theorem, he called it a theorem, uh, given uh, word processing and cut and paste. I think actually the number of errors is more than the usual infinity. Uh, so the content of phi and psi is the content of phi union the content of psi. So what makes phi and psi false is either something that makes, some, makes phi false or something that makes psi false. And then the content of phi or psi, of course, is the intersection. If something makes phi or psi false, it must either make phi false or it must make psi false. And that was uh, Carnap and Bar Hillel's notion of information, what they called semantic information back in 1952. Uh, they also had a quantitative definition. They suggested a numeric measure could be given by counting the number of states and also that you could get the content as a mathematical quantity by taking the probability of A and subtracting it from 1. And this is interesting because we'll see in a moment that this is a kind of a, a similar to uh, Shannon's notion of information. Uh, computer science represents information as a string of zeros and ones, bits, and given a set of indices, uh, you can set any, uh, and any set A subset of I, so any set of indices, uh, can be understood as an index set of bits. One if I is in, zero if I is out, right? So I can represent a given set by 
just a string of ones and zeros. Uh, this is an abstract version of the Carnap and Bar Hillel's notion of information. Note the members of I as being abstractions of state descriptions, like Montague's indices, and view the indexing functions as characteristic functions. So instead of having the set uh, A, I can have its characteristic function, right? Which from e maps each object e either into one if it's in A or into zero if it's not in A. Claude Shannon suggested the quantitative measure of information is roughly the inverse of probability. And I love what he said here. Fre frequently the messages have meaning. That is, they are referred to, or, and his work was basically on messages. That's what he was really interested in, was communication. He was working for Bell Labs at the time. I wonder why. Uh, frequently the messages have meaning. That is, they are referred to or correlated according to some system with certain physical or conceptual entities. These semantic aspects of information are relevant to the engineering problem. Significant aspect is the actual message is one selected from a set of possible messages. The intuitive idea behind Shannon's measure is the more surprising a message is, the more information it contains. So if I tell you it's raining, uh, you're probably not very surprised. Uh, I gave you very little information, something you kind of already knew. Uh, if I tell you a meteor is about to strike the building, that's a lot of information. It's not true, don't worry. Uh, but uh, the idea is that the uh, surprise value is a, in some way a, the measure of the information. And it should be emphasized this is a quantitative theory of information, not a qualitative one. So information is roughly the inverse of probability. If I have this uh, tape, as you might have in a so-called Turing machine, does everybody know what a Turing machine is? I'm going to be using it later on, but a very, very rough idea. It comes from Alan Turing. We just celebrated the centenary of his birth last year. Uh, it was to define basically what a computer is before serious computers have ever been built. Uh, and uh, it, this was done simultaneously by different people in different ways. Alonzo Church, a philosopher uh, at Princeton. Uh, there was uh, a number of different people uh, who uh, developed different notions of co computation called Girdle uh, created one and so on. They all proved out to be equivalent. But, they all, but Turing's involved the idea of a tape. And on the tape, as input, you would have a string of ones and zeros. And then you would have a reader that would read just one square at a time. And it would have a set of states that it could be in, a finite set of states. And depending on what it read, it would e do one of several things. It would either erase what it found or print uh, 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 something on the tape, or then either move left, move right, or stay, and move into another state, which of course could be the same state. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking about Turing machines in a little bit. I thought this was just a good way to introduce the kind of way what uh, the input on a Turing machine might look like. Uh, so you could have a, a one, or you could have a one and a zero, or you could have, say, a one, zero, and a one. And information is roughly the converse of probability. If we just have the one square, maybe this is representing uh, uh, throws of a coin. So maybe that's telling you one is telling you it was heads and there was only one throw. Well, that's a useful piece of information, but its probability where right, was a half. Uh, and so it's not terribly useful. Uh, you, 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 but if it, you had a one and a zero, well, there are four possible ways that could have happened. There could have been a 1-1, one, one, a 0-1, zero, a 0-0, zero, zero, or a 1-0. So to find out it's a 1-0, right, that's more information. Uh, you couldn't have just guessed it as easily. Uh, and of course, with three, there are eight different ways it could be. So we're always going up, you know, exponentially 2 squared, 4, 2 cubed, 8. Next will obviously be 2 to the 4, 16, and so on. And the... Uh, Probability with three that you get it's precisely, let's say, heads, tails, heads on three throws, right? That's one eighth. And so the information 
roughly speaking, right, it increases to seven eighths. Uh, now I say roughly, Shannon's actual formal definition was that the information of an event was the log to the base two of one over the probability of the event. And that's very n a nice way to do things for several practical and mathematical uh, purposes. He liked the idea that if uh, you look at the information in a book, give it a certain value, look at the information in another book, give it a certain value, that the, if you do things uh, uh, with, with the log, the information in the two books is just the, basically the sum of the values. Where, as if you do it some other way, it increases hugely, right? Uh, so anyway, that's the formal property. Uh, I want to talk about algebraic representations. This is, in many ways, uh, what I've spent most of my time on. Uh, the great American mathematician Marshall Stone proved a representation theorem for Boolean algebras. He showed that every Boolean algebra is isomorphic to a collection of sets closed under intersection, union, and relative complement. Now let me try to say what that means. If you take a collection of sets and it's closed under intersection and union and relative complement, U minus A, that will form a Boolean algebra. That's not a big surprise. But Boolean algebras are, can be defined very abstractly by a certain set of axioms. You've got an operation often called meet that's idempotent, commutative, and associative. You've got a, an operation often called join that's also idempotent, commutative, and associative. One is like this, the other is like that. You've got complement, which has certain properties. If uh, the complement of A meet B is the complement of A, uh, join the complement of B, that's the complement of A intersect B is the complement of A, union the complement of B, certain properties. And, uh, oops, more software is available from Apple. Nope. Uh, given, uh, this very abstract characterization, you know, I can have all kinds of things be Boolean algebras. I can draw Boolean algebras on the board, you know, uh, with certain understandings. You know, that's a Boolean algebra. That's a Boolean algebra, and so on. Uh, the question is, are all these abstract Boolean algebras, can they be concretely represented as collections of sets closed under intersection, union, and complement relative to the universe? And the answer is yes. That's what Stone proved. A representation theorems are very important in mathematics. Uh, perhaps one of the most uh, famous is uh, the uh, Cayley representation of groups. Uh, as they can all be represented as groups of transformations where you have actual functions and the group operation is interpreted as composition and the, there's an inverse operation on a group and it's comp, interpreted as converse, just turn the function around and so on. And uh, it, given Boole's primary and secondary interpretations, uh, this can be seen as a theorem showing that Boolean algebra is complete with respect to its interpretation in terms of propositions. Every Boolean algebra can be thought of as formed from a collection of sets, and those sets can be thought of as propositions. So every Boolean algebra can be thought of uh, as a, a interpreted in terms of propositions. Uh, Boolean algebra, the theory, is complete with respect to interpretation in terms of propositions. Now, Stone's representation was extended by himself to something called distributive lattices. This is sort of like Boolean algebras without complement. I think that's all I'll say here. And he showed, in fact, a year later that every distributive lattice is isomorphic to a collection of sets closed under intersection and union, but not necessarily relative complement. This allows for a basic non-classical framework since many non-classical logics have distribution, but not Boolean negation. They have something weaker. There's something called intuitionistic logic. There's many valued logic. There's relevance logic and so on. And I would just give you one quick example from relevance logic. If you look at Boolean logic, classical logic, if you take A intersect A complement, what do you get? The empty set. Uh, 
And the empty set is included in every other set. So if you think of this in a certain way, the, every contradiction entails every other proposition. And that is maybe nice from some points of view, but not so nice from other points of view. If you're interested in so-called paraconsistent logic, as I have been, you don't want a contradiction, just an arbitrary contradiction to imply everything. Uh, if you had some bot searching the web uh, and it found a small contradiction, uh, I don't know, uh, Obama was uh, born in Kenya, <laughs> Obama was not born in Kenya, uh, you wouldn't from that want to be able to infer anything whatsoever, right? Boy, you'd lose a lot on the stock market. <laughs> uh, and uh, you don't want your bot that's searching the web and also making your investments for you to do that either, right? So, you know, you want, there's a role for logics that don't have the property that an inconsistency, especially relatively small inconsistency, uh, implies everything. And, uh, oh, uh, this is an aside here. Uh, Priestley uh, had an interpretation of this that was importantly improved uh, to give him topologic duality. And an important philosophical spin-off was to add to the universe, you. Remember, we have these sets of, and these are sets of states, as it were, and they're thought of as propositions. This universe, you, can be thought of as having a partial order on, order on it, uh, less than or equal, right? Which can be thought of as an information order. So this state contains less information than that state. Uh, Janssen and Tarski. Uh, gave a re representation for Boolean algebras with normal operators, which anticipated the Kripke semantics. They showed how an n area operator can be re represented as a generalized image operator on sets under an n plus one placed relation. Possibility turns out to be such an operator on the, what's called the Lindenbaum algebra of a normal modal logic. A Lindenbaum algebra is what happens when you take provably equivalent sentences and treat them as if they're the same. So if, you know, instead of just saying A is equivalent to B, we can now say A equals B. Uh, and Lemon, in 1966, appears to be the earliest explicit representation of modal algebras in terms of sets. And Goldblatt, 89, extends to the janssen tarski result distributive lattices with operators. And I'll rush through this a bit. Uh, the normality of janssen tarski requires distribution over join, or think of that as disjunction, or and so it would rule out such natural operators as necessity, negation, and implication. If you take the proposition, it's possibly true that A or B, that is equivalent to possibly A or possibly B. But if you take possibly A and B, that's not the same as possibly A and possibly B. I mean, it's possible it's raining. It's possible it's not raining. It's not possible it's raining and not raining. Uh, so what I did was gave a series of papers where I greatly generalized Janssen-Tarski so that you could have operators that would not just distribute over disjunction, but maybe instead distribute over conjunction, like necessity. If A and B is ne necessary, then A is necessary and B is necessary. Uh, and maybe it would co-distribute, like negation does. Negation of A and B isn't the negation of A and the negation of B, it's the negation of A or the negation of B. Changes and to or. And then I had things like implication, which can both distribute, say, in the consequent and co-distribute in the antecedent. So let me just write this. A implies B and C is the same as A implies B and A implies C. That's distribution in the consequent. But A or B implies C is the same as A implies C and B implies C, and that's co-distribution. In the antecedent.
And now you can go on and on. You can have n area operations and all kinds of forms of distribution and co-distribution. And what I was able to show is that a, uh, you can give a representation along the lines of Janssen Tarski for all these algebraic structures or logics, depending on how you look at them. And uh, I think I'll just leave it at that. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, if A or B implies if if A or B implies C, then no matter which is true, you get C. So if A or B implies C, if A implies C, then A or B, and C. If B implies, uh, either A needs to imply C or B needs to imply C, but not both, right? They both do, because if A or B implies C, then if A is the true one, it implies A or B, and hence you get C. If B is the true one, again A or B, hence you get C. Anyway, this is sometimes in logic, uh, this is stated as a sort of a, in what's called natural deduction. This is an elimination rule for or, and this is the introduction rule. Uh, so, sorry. Yeah, that, that's the elimination rule for uh, or going down and up is the uh, introduction rule, as it were. Okay, uh, so generalized Galois logics, uh, I call them GGLs, right? Well, which is the acronym for generalized Galois logic, GGL. And it's pronounced gaggle. Uh, so I invented the term gaggle theory. And I emphasize it's gaggle, as in a gaggle of geese, <laughs> right? Not giggle. <laughs> If you want to make fun of me, you know, call it giggle theory, okay? But please don't. Uh, okay, now we're going to talk for a while about relevance logic. Um, the uh, two valued, four valued semantics. Uh, the Carnap and Bar Hillel semantics validates the entailment of every proposition whatsoever by a contradiction. I've already told you that. This is just because the information of a contradiction is empty. Uh, that would be the information of phi and not phi is the information in phi and the in complementing information phi intersected together, which of course is empty. So any state of information that makes phi and not phi true would make psi true because there are no such states. Now I created something back in my dissertation. I realize I'm talking to a number of graduate students here. I've already told some of you that a former student of mine, a Gary Hard degree, wrote a book on algebraic logic with him, came into my office one day and said the only uh, essential, I know the, I finally figured out what the essential property of a dissertation is. I said, what is it, Gary? And he said, that it's finished. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you a little story about my own dissertation. I had a very good advisor, Newell Belknap, I've mentioned his name before. I was, uh, basically completed my, uh, everything but the last chapter of my dissertation. My last chapter of the dissertation was to show that certain logics were decidable, right? That there was an algorithm for showing that uh, these were certain relevance logics, uh, an algorithm for sh showing that whether a given formula is a theorem or not a theorem. Uh, Newell very kindly told me I was completed uh, and uh, not to worry about that last chapter. And I completed my dissertation in 1966. 1985, Al Alistair Urquhart, another student of Newell Belknaps, showed that these logics were all undecidable. Remember, I was going to show them decidable. Uh, so uh, it's a, it's, well, how to put it, and it's a cooperative effort between a student and the teacher, right, to, to get that dissertation finished. Uh, and I took Gary's point to be he was essentially finished. He was right. Uh, so we start with, and this was the word I used then, a set of situations, U. Not possible worlds, because they might not be possible. These situations might be incomplete. They might be inconsistent. And I now prefer to use the word information state, but that's what I used back then. And I had that every proposition stood for a pair. There was an A plus and an A minus. 
the states that essentially made it true and the states that essentially made it false. And the complement, of course, just reverses those two. Uh, the negation, I should say. It's not literally a complement. And these A plus and A minus, they can overlap. There can be, uh, this can be describing an impossible situation. It could also, they can be incomplete. There can be a situation it's not even talking about, right? One way or the other. And then the inner conjunction of two proposition surrogates, as I called them, was to intersect the uh, first two components, the A plus and the B plus, and union the second two components, the A minus and the B minus. So you want the states that make the conjunction true, you form the intersection, the ones that make both true. You want the states that make it false, you form the union of the ones that make either one false. With disjunction, you just dualize, do the union in the first part, but now the intersection in the second part. And we say that A plus A minus entails B plus B minus if and only if A plus is included in B plus. So every situation that makes A true makes B true. And just the reverse, right? Every situation that makes B false makes A false. It's a kind of contrapositive, as we logicians say. And I showed that these represent De Morgan lattices. I won't tell you what those are, but they're a weaker form of Boolean algebra where contradictions don't imply everything. Uh, a meet complement of A is not zero. And uh, these are distributive lattices with an involution. So it's basically a, a, something very much like De Morgan complement, but it's not. It's weaker. And then in 69, uh, I extended this to the idea of a four-valued logic uh, where we could have the value of a proposition. Instead of being zero, either 0 or 1, it could be a subset of the pair set 0 and 1. So it could contain be just 0, that means it's false. It could contain just 1, that means it's true. Uh, it could contain neither. It could just be the empty set. That means it's neither true nor false. And it could contain both. That means it's both true and false. Now, if you think this is a little bit crazy, back when I proposed this, it was really crazy. Uh, but since then, there's been a kind of industry developed around so-called para-consistent logic. Uh, and the idea is that you put 1 in the value of not phi, just in case 0 was in the value of phi. Of course, both might have been in there. Uh, and so that might end up with both 1 and 0 uh, because we have 0 in the value of not phi if 1 is in the value of phi. So we do it both ways. I've called this, uh, talking to economists here, I know not accountants, but double entry bookkeeping. <laughs> Usually you can just say, well, if it's not, there's not a 1 there, there must be a 0 there. Now here you have to be careful because it, it, you're doing it twice, once for 1 and once for 0. And then 1, of course, is in the value of a conjunction, just in case 1 is in both values. 0 is in the value of the conjunction, just in case 0 is in one of those values. Conjunction is false, just in case you know, at least one part of it is false. Disjunction is just the uh, dual. Uh, and uh, 1 is in the value of phi or psi, just in case 1 is in either value. 0 is in, just in case 0 is in both values. And uh, if we parameterize this to a set u, we get back the proposition surrogates by saying, letting the value of phi right, be a pair consisting of the sentences uh, one, sentences alpha so that one is in the value assigned to alpha together within the set of sentences alpha such that zero is assigned to uh, the value. And uh, so, no, I'm not doing this right, sorry. Uh, this is the set of states, the sets of situations alpha, so that one is assigned to the sentence phi in that situation. And then together with the set of states or situations alpha, so that zero is assigned to phi in that situation. And you can get back and forth between the proposition surrogates and this way of looking at things in terms of four values. Now, I've completed my introduction of logic and information. Now, I'm not through with the talk yet, Amos. Uh, 
Uh, either that or I could go another 20 minutes, do you think? Whatever. Okay. Uh, what I'll tell you, uh, Amos explained this was two and a half hours, which of course is a long time. I'm used to giving talks in roughly an hour. So I took a couple of different things and put them together. And I think I maybe overdid it. I think I probably have about an hour and a half of talk, no, if that's okay. That's cool. So let's take a break now. Then we'll take a 10 minute break, then we'll let 